So good evening and thanks for joining us for the first spring <laughs> Libertyville Historical Society History Matters program. I'm Jenny Berry and this is my fellow Libertyville History Historical Society board member, Pamela Kruger. All right, before we get started, I want to make you aware of some of our upcoming programs. Uh, we're going to try and do these next two as hybrid programs, allowing a limited number of in-person attendance and then on Zoom as well. So we'll cross our fingers and see how that goes. So coming up on Monday, March 20th, we have uh, Dale Eggert from Libertyville High School, who will, in, uh, in honor of Women's History Month, be talking about women's athletics before and after Title IX at Libertyville High School. And then Monday, April 17th, we have author David Sadowski, who has published a new um, Images of the Rail North Shoreline book. Um, he will be in person here at Cook Library, and we're also going to try and do that via Zoom at the same time um, to talk about the North Shore line, the electric line that came into Libertyville and was discontinued in 1963. Uh, if you would like to register, please visit the library's events page at cooklib.org slash events or call the library at 847-362-2330 to uh, register for those programs and let them know whether you're going to want to attend in person or online. All right, um, a couple of housekeeping notes. Um, as soon as we get started here, Pamela and I are going to turn off the video so that you can focus in on the lovely presentation slides and not on our faces. We will not see your questions or your chat while we are presenting. Please feel free to put them in the chat or in the Q&A, uh, but we will address them at the end of the program. All right. So, oh, and I said I was gonna turn the video off, so now I'm gonna turn the video off. Hold on just a second. All right. Tonight's program grew out of a short presentation that Pamela and I prepared for this year's Lake County History Symposium, which was held in January. If you attended the symposium, uh, some of tonight's program will be familiar to you, but we have expanded the presentation past the symposium's 20 to 25 minute time limit. Most of the presentations for this year's symposium, which had the theme Eat, Drink, and Be Merry, focused on food. And while food will make an appearance in our stories, we're going to focus on the hospitality aspect of the theme and introduce you to a selection of hotels from Libertyville's past. So what comes to mind when you think of a hotel in 2023? What services are you seeking? Are you just looking for a room? Maybe you'd like breakfast to be included, or perhaps you're looking for a swimming pool for the kids. Well, the definition of a hotel for tonight's program is a bit broader, but all have one thing in common, a place to stay for the night, whether it be for just one or for many. The word hotel first appears in the English language in the 1760s for the French hotel, which referred to a nobleman's house, a town hall, think of the Hotel de Ville in Paris, or a large official building. In English, it referred to a guest house of high quality, but it could also be used colloquially when referring to a public house, tavern, or inn. Inns and taverns existed in what would become the United States as early as the 1650s and grew in number during the colonial period and especially after the American Revolution as travel increased. If it was known as a public house, the business was licensed by local or regional authorities and was allowed to sell alcohol as long as they also provided overnight accommodations. Most of them were not purpose-built, but instead were housed in converted homes or other structures. As the population moved west, accommodations were needed for those passing through and for those new to town. Local residents took the opportunity to fill the need. In 1835, Libertyville's first white settlers, George Barden, his wife and his daughter, arrived in this area inhabited by the Potawatomi tribe. The Vardens moved on within a year and others migrated from New England, traveling north from Chicago along the Milwaukee Trace, today's Milwaukee Avenue, on the high ground above the Des Plaines River. Settlers originally named the town Vardens Grove. In June, 1836, a stagecoach line was established along the new Milwaukee Road connecting Chicago to Milwaukee. 
The road cut through the fledgling community and helped to secure its future. A month later, on July 4th, 1836, the settlers erected a flagpole in a small clearing and dubbed the community Independence Grove. However, when the new town applied for a post office in 1837, it was found that another Independence Grove already existed in Illinois. The name Libreville was suggested and the petition was granted. With a stage line running through town, it's not surprising that services for travelers sprung up. The earliest mention of such an establishment in Libertyville is found in John Halsey's History of Lake County, which reports that Maria Crane of Burlington Precinct was granted a tavern license in 1839. Libertyville was known as Burlington during its time as the first Lake County seat from 1839 to 1841. Maria Crane, also known as Anna Maria Crane, was the wife of William Crane, and the couple is seen here. The family came from Vermont in 1836 and staked a claim on the west side of the New Milwaukee Road, just north of the present Cook Avenue. The family was involved in various enterprises, including a sawmill and a flour mill. We don't know exactly when the Crane Tavern ceased operations, but according to the history of the Apley family in America on file at the Cook Memorial Library, the family was still taking in boarders when Calvin Apley arrived in 1843. That year, Calvin Apley came to Illinois from Connecticut to do masonry work on a hotel in Chicago. When the work was completed that fall, he joined his co-workers, the Bartlett brothers, in Libertyville to stay the winter instead of going back east. He roomed with the Cranes. Calvin must have enjoyed his stay because he married the Cranes' daughter within a year. The family history reports that the new couple took over the hotel and ran it for the next five years before moving to a farm just north of town in 1849. Perhaps that's when the Crane Tavern ceased business. It's also possible the Crane Apley family gave up the tavern due to competition from the next hotel in our survey. The Grove Hotel or Grove House would likely be categorized by historian A.K. Sandoval Strauss as a settlement hotel, a hotel built to serve a newly established town or one seeing sudden growth. In his book, Hotel in American History, settlement hotels are described as mostly wood framed with a pitched roof and quote, almost universally painted white. The quote, most distinctive and consistent feature of these hotels was quote, long balconies that extended along each story. Looking at this picture, I think the Grove House fits the bill. Sources vary as to when the Grove Hotel was built. It may have been as early as 1840. Original owner Davis C. Steele came to Libertyville in 1835. So the 1840 date is conceivable, but we know for certain the hotel was in operation by August, 1851 when Waukegan Gazette editor Nathan Gere made a tour of Lake County. Reporting on his visit to Libertyville, Gere complimented Steele, the proprietor of the only hotel in the place, a commodious two and a half story building with lodging for over 50 and a ballroom the whole length of a house. The hotel is also referenced by historian Elijah Haynes in his 1852 historical and statistical sketches of Lake County where he reported that Libertyville contains at the present time some three or 400 inhabitants, two or three stores, a large commodious hotel, a steam flouring mill and sawmill, and above all, two fine churches. Local lore relates that the Grove House, shown here on an 1873 bird's eye view lithograph, and located today where the Proctor building is, which we'll talk about a little later, that has uh, the gelato shop in it and um, some other stores as well. So the local lore is that it was a stage cuts, stagecoach stop on the Frank and Walker stagecoach line and horses were changed at the livery station at the hotel. One story says it was the practice of the stagecoach drivers to whip their teams into a run as they neared the hotel and pull up with a flourish. Another story says that at times the mud on the Milwaukee road was so deep the stage couldn't go on and passengers had to stay overnight in the hotel. Seems very convenient. Original owner Davis Steele died in 1855, but the hotel continued to be referred to as Steele's Hotel or the Grove Hotel or Grove House until 1877. 
During those two decades, several different proprietors ran the hotel. Eli Penniman was associated with the Grove, hotel, Grove House from about 1851 until 1864 when he moved to Shields Township. After Penniman's move, a string of other names are found associated with the Grove House. In 1866, F. Galloway, likely Dr. Samuel Galloway, is named as the proprietor in a notice about an 1866 Christmas night ball. W.P. Farnham took over by 1868 and was in charge of the hotel until his retirement in 1876, at which time a Mr. William Kelsey acquired the hotel. The hotel's run as the Grove House came to an end in 1877 when A.G. Fisher took over. In addition to changing the business name to the Fisher House, the new owner removed the bar and ran the hotel as a temperance house. No alcohol was served. Not all of the locals were happy with this change. The Waukegan newspaper reported that at a September 1877 dance, celebrating that year's Lake County Fair proceedings, some quote, brutes from the east part of town came for the purpose of breaking up the dance in a fight because Fisher kept a temperance house. Apparently the men started a fight amongst themselves, which drove all the respectable people home. The men were banned from the hotel and the proprietors promised to pursue legal charges. A look at the hotel's inhabitants as recorded in the 1880 US Census provides a glimpse of life at Libreville in the time. Mobile generations of the Fisher family participated in the upkeep of the business, assisted by at least three servants who were present at the time the census taker stopped by. The first servant listed, Fred Sudam was born in 1855, grew up on a farm north of town and went to the old Bush School, which was located along Butterfield Road, north of Winchester. According to his obituary, Fred was the first mail carrier when the mail route was established between Lake Forest and Libertyville prior to the railroad coming to Libertyville and he made the trip via horseback. Most of those staying at the hotel were young, male and single. They may have been new to town or moved into town to be closer to work as a wagon maker, flax mill employee, or shoemaker. The hotel may have served as a permanent residence for them. The name that stands out on this list for his place in one of Libertyville's history's mysteries is August Rosine. August Rosine, a native of Germany, was caretaker and gardener of Ansel B. Cook's Libertyville home and grounds. He was found dead in Butler Lake in May, 1885. According to newspaper accounts, on the night of Monday, May 13th, Rosine had eaten at the Fisher House where he regularly took his meals, but did not live as he had a room in the cook home. He went out with some friends, but returned to the cook home about 9 p.m. to retire for the evening. Rosine did not show up at the Fisher House on Tuesday morning for his breakfast, but people weren't too concerned, thinking that maybe he went to Chicago to meet with Mr. Cook at his city residence. But when by Wednesday morning, Rosine had not appeared, a telegram was sent to Cook asking if Rosine was with him. He was not. A search was made of the house. The newspaper reported that some blood was found on doorknobs, the floor, and stairway, and a window was open on the second floor. That evening, E.W. Parkus took a boat out on Butler Lake to investigate sightings of a dark object. It turned out to be the body of August Rosine. Rosine was taken to the cook home and the coroner was called. The ruling was death by strangulation before Rosine was put in the lake. There was no mention in newspaper coverage of any cuts or other injuries that might have been the cause of the blood noticed at the house. Rosine was carrying $120 in gold coin, 50 cents in silver, and $950 in bills, which is over $23,000 today, and it was sewn into his inside pocket. Additional money was found in his room, along with $2,300 in promissory notes, basically IOUs for money he had lent to others. Mr. Cook theorized that Rosine was killed by some men he had lent money to in the past, two of which he had been out with the night of his murder. There was no more news until November when those two men, Stephen Botter and Barthold Metzer, were charged with the murder based on work done by Pinkerton detectives. The case against Batter was argued over three days. The evidence was considered circumstantial and he was found not guilty. No mention of the other man's fate was reported in the newspaper. 
not much more is known. If you're interested in reading through some of the newspaper coverage of the day, you're welcome to come in to the Cook Library and look at the Ansipi Cook folder in the local history file or search our newspapers.com uh, account either in-house or remotely if you are a district resident. About 1891, the Fisher family sold out to brothers Robert Charles and Richard Proctor. Notices of dancing uh, and masquerade balls at Proctor's Hall could be found even in the Interocean newspaper of Chicago. Although the Proctors appear to have maintained ownership of the building, by 1894, Ava May Spoor was the proprietress. The business card, postcard, and tickets on the upper left of the screen are part of the Libertyville Historical Society collection. Mrs. Spoor's tenure was rather short, lasting less than a year as far as we can tell. By February 1st, 1895, the hotel had changed names once more. It was now called the Commercial Hotel under the leadership of George B. Mason. Over its lifetime, the 19th century Libreville landmark was home to social parties, political conventions, traveling doctors, a barber shop, an ice cream parlor, and a billiards room. Longtime Libreville residents remembered the Fisher House as a social center of town, and more than one recalled learning to roller skate in the ballroom. The hotel welcomed guests in town for the annual Lake County Fair, provided a home away from home for travelers of all types, and offered a meal and a drink, at least in its early days, to locals. It all came to an end on the night of August 30th, 31st, 1895, when a fire destroyed the commercial hotel and over 20 other buildings on the east side of Milwaukee Avenue, north of today's Cook Avenue. You can see the remains of the commercial hotel's foundation and a melted hotel sign in this photograph of the fire's aftermath. Although the Grove House slash Fisher House slash Hotel Spore slash Commercial Hotel was gone, Liberville was not without a hotel. The current hotel near Liberville, Chicago, Milwaukee, and St. Paul Railroad Depot had been operating since 1881. A new passenger train railroad depot opened in downtown Libertyville in 1880. On May 31st of that year, residents celebrated when the first locomotive blew its whistle in the village. The Chicago, Milwaukee, and St. Paul Railroad had run a line from Chicago to Milwaukee eight years earlier, in 1872, but it was on the east side of the Des Plaines River. The closest stop to the village was Libertyville Junction, which is known today as Rondout. In the late 1870s, a committee of local businessmen struck a deal with the railroad company. The railroad would equip the road and run, run one train each day into town, providing the people of Libertyville would grade the road, build the bridge, and provide the land for the depot. The new railroad stop spurred rapid growth in Libertyville businesses and created a growing need for traveler accommodations. A local farmer, Henry Kern, saw an opportunity. He knew other farmers from the area surrounding Libertyville would need temporary lodging when they hauled their grain and other agricultural products to Libertyville for shipping to markets near and far. In 1881, Kern and his wife, Mary Christina, established the Kern Hotel and Livery Stable on the northwest corner of First Street and what was then called Orchard Street. Today, Orchard Street is Church Street. A local newspaper reported that the structure cost around $2,100 to build. Henry Kern was born in Pennsylvania in 1833 to a farming family. He first came to Fremont Township at age 21 in 1854. Mary was born in Erie County, New York in 1843. The couple married in 1860, and in 1862 at the age of 29, Henry Kern enlisted with the Union's 96th Regiment Illinois Volunteers. He was supposed to serve for three years. However, he was discharged from service nine months into his enlistment after suffering an injury while stocking a steamship. He returned home and after recovering, he and Mary farmed in Fremont Township from 1865 until the Milwaukee and St. Paul Railroad was extended to Libertyville in 1880. The Kern family left their farm, moved to Libertyville and opened the Kern Hotel in a spot that was easily accessible to the new passenger train depot. Their plan was a success. After about a year, um, since they were open, a local paper reported that Henry Kern's hotel near the depot had such a run of business that he needed to expand the property to be able to accommodate numerous patrons. 
In addition to the passenger train delivering travelers and attracting area businessmen to downtown Libertyville in unprecedented numbers, the current hotel may have benefited from another business attracting visitors to the town, the Hygienia Springs Water Company, later known as Abana Springs. A 1903 special edition of the Lake County Independent lauded Abana Springs founder Frederick Grabby as the first citizen of Libertyville to exploit the medicinal waters of the village. These medicinal waters may have been an initial draw for the Kern Hotel's frequent guests, famous siblings and little people, Charles and Eliza Nestle, who made appearances under their stage names, Commodore Foote and the Fairy Queen. The siblings toured the US and Europe. They met President and Mrs. Lincoln at a White House reception in February, 1864, and performed for many members of the royal family, including Queen Victoria. The siblings also made appearances at the Lake County Fair. On September 24th, 1897, the Lake County Independent newspaper reported, Commodore Foote and Queenie Nestle attracted much attention at the fairgrounds. Everyone was delighted by their courteous and inviting mannerisms. Charles and Eliza traveled to Libertyville almost every summer from their home in Fort Wayne, Indiana. Eliza enjoyed her time in Libertyville. In the 1897 Libertyville Illustrated, which was a booster pamphlet, she was quoted as saying, I have been almost constantly traveling for 25 years and more, but never discovered such a charming village as Libertyville, which I have visited many times. Commodore Foote endorsed Libertyville spring water in the same publication, saying he had traveled all over Europe and visited nearly all its famous watering resorts, but I have never drank water to compare with that of Libertyville. Eliza agreed. I have derived great benefit from it, she said. During the past two months, I have gained eight pounds, which is considerable for someone who never weighed more than 60. The siblings were very close personal friends of the Kearns. They continued to visit and stay with the Kern family in their home after the Kearns passed the management of the hotel to new proprietors. Charles Nestle came back to Libertyville in 1918 to attend Henry Kern's funeral. From its earliest days, the Kern Hotel property welcomed both travelers and long-term tenants. The 1900 census lists many permanent residents. And if you look where the red square is, right there, um, you can see that they are almost all railroad laborers. Construction of the Libertyville to Fox Lake Spur began in 1899. So it's likely that the Kern Hotel provided a temporary home for the workers on this project. Local publications provide additional information on the Kern Hotel and its reputation for hospitality. The 1897 Libertyville Illustrated said the hotel has seldom lacked for guests and is often unable to entertain all comers. Mrs. Kern's obituary states, the Kern house was known for its excellent table, which Mrs. Kern personally supervised seeing that her guests received the best of everything. The Kerns ran the property until about 1898 when Ed Clark and his wife became proprietors. Not long after the Kern Hotel changed hands, the Lake County Independent reported, Mr. and Mrs. F. E. Clark, who are ably sustaining the reputation it has for years born as Libertyville's popular hotel. Their rates are reasonable and the table and service leave nothing to be desired. The Clarks ran the property until 1905 when they moved to Southern Illinois. The 1907 Sanborn map at the top of the slide shows the property listed as the Hotel Brown. There doesn't seem to be the same kind of praising newspaper coverage or promotional material to be found for the hotel after Frank Brown assumed ownership from the clerks. However, in 1908, local news covered a few crimes and accidents related to the Brown Hotel and to Frank Brown. In February 1908, a man who worked for a local farmer succumbed to a noxious gas leak dying in his hotel bed there in the Hotel uh, Brown. In May of that year, three Melody Farm laborers were robbed of all of their possessions while they slept by another hotel occupant who was reported to have been raising cane the evening before the midnight theft. And in September 1908, Frank Brown witnessed the fatal goring of a Lake Forest man employed by meatpacking magnate J. Ogden Armour. The incident occurred as the man was moving bulls through the Libertyville Depot for exhibition at the Lake County Fair. In March, uh, the March 3rd, 1911, Lake County Independent reported, Mrs. C. Spring has leased to Frank Brown his property known as the Kern Hotel and takes possession the 1st of April. 
Clara Spring was well known for the Spring Cafe restaurant she ran on Milwaukee Avenue in Libertyville that had been in operation since 1901. We know from her 1931 obituary that she maintained the Spring Cafe until 1925. However, it is not known how or for how long she operated the Spring Hotel. In the 1924 Sanborn map, the property was identified as a residence rather than a hotel. In December 1958, the Independent Register mentions that the current hotel property was still standing. Village property records indicate the multifamily home on this spot was deemed uninhabitable in 1975 and was demolished. In 1986, the Libertyville Terrace or the Liberty Terrace apartment building went up on the site of the old Kern Hotel. So far, the hotels we have discussed have long since disappeared from the Libertyville landscape. Our next hotel building is still extant. The Queen Anne style commercial block at 355 to 357 North Milwaukee Avenue was erected in 1896 by James Triggs. James Triggs was part of a large family connection who had come to Lake County from England in the mid 1800s. He and various cousins and siblings numbered among the prominent merchants of Libertyville in the late 19th century. In the wake of the 1895 Liberal fire on the east side of Milwaukee Avenue, downtown was developed and redeveloped quickly. James Triggs put up this red brick building in 1896, and by summer 1897, the Libertyville Hotel opened for business. The hope was to draw summer visitors from Chicago, as well as locals, to dine. The new hotel had 15 large bedrooms and a parlor on the second floor, with a saloon and dining room on the first floor, featuring an ice box and cigar case, and being lighted with electricity, which was new to Libertyville that year. To cater to summer guests, it offered conveyances in the adjacent stable to those who wished to tour nearby lakes. The Libertyville Hotel benefited from the patronage of bicyclists who came through Libertyville following the Waukegan Century Course, a 100 mile route that ran north from Chicago through Wheeling to Waukegan and then back south through the lakeshore towns. The Libertyville Hotel was included on a list of League of American Wheelmen hotels in Illinois, further promoting it as cyclist friendly. As we saw with the Grove House, the Libertyville Hotel may have also served as a residence for single men. The 1900 census shows that long, young lawyer Paul McGuffin, age 27 and single, is possibly living at the hotel. His office was on the second floor of what is now the Picnic Basket Building, so he would have had a very short commute. Paul's father was pastor of the Methodist Church in town. Paul graduated from Northwestern University Law School in 1895, and he served as mayor of Libertyville from 1905 to 1907. But at the Cook home, we like to think of him as Mabel McGuffin's husband, due to the fact that Mabel's wedding dress is in our collection. Mabel Peck made a Benedict of Paul, a newly married man who has long been a bachelor, when they married August 12, 1908. Over the course of the 20 plus years the building served as a hotel, it was remodeled several times, most notably in 1902, when a large water tank was erected, seen here in the rear of the photo, to provide a water supply. This enabled the hotel to provide baths, water closets, and lavatories a few years before the village would have its own water tower. By 1919, the Libreville Hotel had ceased operation and the building was referred to as the Kennedy Building. Over the years, the building has been home to a car dealer, bank, real estate and insurance offices, and a beauty salon. While the upstairs rooms were converted to apartments and offices, the building's first floor has been used as a gathering and dining space off and on throughout its history. Such restaurants as Proctor's Chatterbox, a popular teen hangout in the 50s, that place on the corner, and Summit Ice Cream have inhabited the Libreville Hotel building. The Conscious Cup coffee roasters have graced the corner since 2020. As mentioned earlier, Libreville was known for its mineral water. It also had sulfur springs, yet there was never a resort built like the one at French Lick, Indiana. But there were a few attempts. In an essay written by local historian C.E. Carroll in the mid-1950s, Carroll recounts that Frederick Grabby and Walter Newberry of Athana Springs fame also bottled sulfur water that flowed from the bank of the Desplaines River near the Rockland Road Bridge under the name Vital Water. 
The story continues that Newberry brought in Army engineers to survey the situation at the Sulphur Spring, but their verdict was that it would entail an expenditure of some $200,000, which is over $7 million today, to develop the spring properly. The whole course of the river would have to be changed to divert the dirty water from the spring, and that idea was abandoned. The idea of a resort surfaced again in 1901, when a group of Chicago investors sought to create a resort on the west side of Butler Lake on land owned by S.I. Pope. They planned a hotel, cottages with accommodations for 500 guests, a boathouse, a golf course, and an amusement hall with billiards, bowling, a shooting gallery, and more. But as with developers today, the team requested concessions from the village and its citizens. A meeting of residents was called to solicit subscriptions for a $2,500 bonus to be paid to the developers. But subscription levels did not meet with the immediate success they had anticipated, reported the newspaper. Residents had questions about the plans and there was a general feeling that the developers were not pledging money in proportion to that being solicited. Residents also wanted certain privileges to be granted to the village people, such as the right to continue to cut ice on the lake without charge, but the developers refused. Ultimately, the two sides came to an impasse. Only $1,000 of the requested $2,500 was raised and the developers pulled out. However, two years later, another hotel will be built in downtown Libertyville. The Libertyville Hotel wasn't the only hotel to spring up after the fire of 1895. It took a few years, but the Proctor brothers built a new hotel on the same spot as the commercial hotel. From 1900 to 1910, 11 buildings were constructed within the Central Business District, nine along Milwaukee Avenue and two on Cook Avenue, likely spurred by the arrival of the Chicago North Shore and Milwaukee Electric Railroad on the south side of town in 1903. The most important commercial building erected during that time was the Proctor Building. Designed by Chicago architect William Craig, the two-story brick building housed commercial storefronts and the Newcastle Hotel. The block was lauded by the Lake County Independent as, quote, Libertyville's first metropolitan building, the pride of all citizens. Towns five times the size of Libertyville cannot boast of buildings similar to the Proctor block. With 110 feet of Milwaukee Avenue footage and a stretch of plate glass storefronts, the two-story structure was the most impressive building the town had yet erected. All of the building entrances and the hotel vestibule welcomed customers with mosaic floor tiling. At the back was a garden and trees. Conveniences included steam heat and modern plumbing and toilet provisions of the day provided by a private water supply. When it debuted in 1904, the first class hotel was divided into 26 apartments for bedroom and parlor purposes, reception rooms, and a hotel office. In its early years, Mrs. Olive Cole managed the hotel. In 1905, she sold the business to Peter Mowers. The hotel offered both a European plan, just a room, and an American plan, a room plus meals. The new castle offered dining for both guests and locals, and apparently wasn't beyond poaching talent from its competitors, as seen here in these October 1909 notices in the local newspaper, advertising the migration of the Libreville Hotel chef to the new castle. In 1918, Richard Duddles, a relative of the Proctor family, and his wife Lulu had assumed management of the hotel and building. Sadly, tragedy struck the Duddles when Richard and his son were killed in an automobile accident in 1925, but Lulu carried on as owner for the next few decades. One notable resident of the Newcastle Hotel was Dennis Limberry. Limberry was born on a farm two miles southeast of Libertyville. Good natured and affable, Libertyville moved to Libertyville in his late teens, quickly becoming personally acquainted with almost everyone in town. In 1882, Limbury was elected town marshal. In 1896, he was elected as constable, as thistle commissioner in 1902, and deputy sheriff for the county in 1903. By 1912, Limbury had added bailiff and fire marshal to the list, bringing his total number of jobs to six. Limbury was known for going above and beyond. He often raked up all the bits of paper and peanut shells along Milwaukee Avenue and tended to the flower garden under the village's original water tower. Over the course of his career, he became well known for his small acts of kindness, from giving needy families coal for cold winter nights or visiting with sick residents. He was especially kind to children. 
He was known to confiscate slingshots and give the kids a scolding, but then more often than not, send them away with a dime for a movie showing that same night. Lindbergh had passed away in his sleep in his room at the Newcastle Hotel on the night of December 28, 29, 1928. His passing made front page news. His body lay in state at the village hall for three days. Businesses closed the day of his funeral at St. Joseph's Church, which was attended by almost a thousand people. As a tribute, citizens raised money for a memorial. The money was used to furnish a children's room at the new Condell Hospital, which opened the previous year. Milwaukee Avenue was already a main route for travelers between Wisconsin and Illinois. When the road was paved in 1923, traffic increased exponentially. The Newcastle Hotel was a convenient stop on the route as well as being within walking distance of both the Chicago, Milwaukee, and St. Paul and the North Shore Electric train lines. By the mid 1930s, the Newcastle Hotel featured 14 hotel rooms and eight one room kitchenette apartments. These efficiency apartments proved popular as a first home for newlyweds, including Earl and Jerry Mather, who moved into one of the apartments after their marriage in the late 1940s. After a long tenure as owner, Lulu Duddle sold the building in 1949. The new castle continued to operate as a licensed hotel into the 1990s. In the 1980s, rooms could be rented for $55 to $65 per week. Rooms with private bathrooms cost more and provided a source of inexpensive housing for those with limited incomes, which was in short supply in the area. Some of the residents worked in local factories, restaurants, or even at the Winchester House nursing home. But keeping up with needed repairs in the then 80-year-old building was sometimes difficult. Manager Patricia Reed often spent her own money on furnishings and decoration. New owners Sandy and Dave Whitmore restored the building in the late 1990s and created 13 one-bedroom apartments out of the former hotel rooms. Today, the building is on the National Register of Historic Places. New hotels were constructed north of town in the mid to late 20th century. The Hitchin Post was the first. Post-World War II America saw the rise of automobile culture and with it, the road trips heyday. Motels popped up across the country, designed specifically to accommodate people traveling by car. Vacationers could park right outside their rooms, making it easier to get luggage in on arrival and back out when it was time to hit the road again. The 1950s and 1960s were the peak years in the motel industry. And right in the center of it, longtime Libertyville resident and antique automobile enthusiast, Earl R. Young built Liberty's first motel, opening the Hitch Inn Post Motel on the southwest corner of North Milwaukee Avenue and Peterson Road, known today as Route 137. Young served as the general contractor for the project, building the motel himself on what was once his family's farm. He housed and displayed his collection of antique automobiles at the motel. The motel's name reflected the mid-century fascination with all things Western and also recalled Milwaukee Avenue's hitching post history. The road was paved just 35 years before Earl Young built the motel, marking the complete transformation from a dirt road to a smooth thoroughfare for the increasing number of automobiles that replaced the horse as our choice of transportation. Most of the post-World War II motel surge followed the U.S. Congress passing the Interstate Highway of 1956, which enabled unprecedented ease of travel across the states. The north-south segment of the Tri-State Tollway, I-94, was completed in 1958. In addition to catering to travelers that had new access to the area, Mr. Young noticed that businessmen who were visiting Libertyville companies, such as the Frank G. Huff Company, which was then by then a division of International Harvester, were staying in rooms in Waukegan. Mr. Young saw a business opportunity in providing them with more convenient accommodations. In 1992, Earl Young told the Chicago Tribune, my prime accounts early on were the traveling business people who were coming to sell and service the quickly growing industries in town. The 18 unit motel opened in the spring of 1959. Each room had air conditioning, TV, hi-fi, and wall-to-wall -wall carpeting. The number and size of local businesses continued to grow after the Hitchin Post opened, prompting several expansions to be able to keep up with the growing demand for accommodations. The Hitchin Post expanded three times in 1962, 1969, and in 1981, increasing the number of guest rooms from 18 to 144. 
The property grew in other ways as well, and it became a destination for visitors and for locals. In 1973, Mr. Young added the Cabriolet restaurant with seating for up to 500 people. The restaurant was named for the 1929 Pierce Aero Cabriolet, one of the 14 antique cars on display in the specially designed no admission fee museum in the motel basement. In May of 1973, Earl Young told the Independent Register, we've been planning this for at least five years. At first, my wife and I didn't plan for it to be so large, but we began, began, we began getting calls for banquets seating 200 or more. We turned down at least one such banquet a week. As he did with the construction of the motel, Earl Young served as the general contractor for the restaurant build. And also like the motel, the Cabriolet was a hit with both visitors and people who lived in the area. According to an, eight, an April 20th, 1978 Chicago Tribune review of the restaurant, a month before the holiday, Mr. Young already had Easter reservations booked for more than 500 guests. The same article described the decor in the Cabriolet as a combination of early American and Western with cathedral ceilings, rough hewn beams, and a large fireplace. It said the walls were adorned with antique dishes and clocks that were almost as impressive as the autos. The Cabriolet offered breakfast, lunch, and dinner seven days a week, including a Sunday brunch and a Friday night seafood buffet. Guests could also enjoy the Cabriolet Dinner Theater, which offered Broadway style shows performed by professionals and local actors. There were two banquet spaces in the Cabriolet. The larger one could seat 280 people and had its own bar and kitchen. The restaurant also had two lounges. The Tin Lizzie Lounge had lighting provided almost exclusively by antique auto lanterns, a player piano, and photos of Libertyville in the early 1900s. I looked it up, a Tin Lizzie was a slang term for a cheap, old, or rundown automobile. The Rumble Seat Lounge was dimly lit and warmly appointed and offered weekend entertainment from weekday host Tony Treccia, whose piano skills allowed him to play a wide range of audience requests from the classics to the day's popular music. Rounding out the list of hitch and post amenities on the 96 acre property was a public nine hole par three golf course complete with a lake that was visible in part through the large windows of the Cabriolet restaurant. According to the Tribune Review, the Hitch and Post Golf Course was popular with golfers who want to get out and perfect their iron game and putting stroke. In 1996, the Hitch and Post was host to the 33rd Annual Convention of the International Association of Jazz Record Collectors. Longtime Libertyville resident and passionate jazz enthusiast Phil, Phil Popsicala, who was president of the association at the time, brought this event to the Hitchin Post. 200 IAJRC members came to Libertyville from across the U.S. and from Canada, England, Germany, Argentina, and South Korea for three days of lectures, buying and trading records, watching jazz films, and enjoying hot jazz sets in Chicago and at the Hitchin Post restaurant. Mr. Young continued managing the Hitchin Post property after it became a Best Western member property in 1976. He retired in 1985, but retained ownership. In the 1990s, the Cabriolet restaurant was no longer profitable, so Young leased the building to a restaurateur. It first became Raffaelli's and later was named Bellini's. When the state began enforcing the accessibility requirements of the Americans with Disabilities Act, Young decided against making the costly renovations. The restaurant was torn down in 2003. The Wildberry restaurant that stands on the site today was built in 2004. On May 29, 2005, Earl Young passed away at the age of 75. In October the same year, the hotel closed. The remaining Hitchin Post property was demolished in 2010. The Daily Herald noted this moment as the end of an era. Builders have just recently begun construction of a townhouse development called Libertyville Junction on the land that has stood empty for more than a decade. Today, Libertyville is home to several chain hotels, which serve the needs of visitors to Great America Naval Training Station Great Lakes, and businesses such as Abbott Laboratories, USG, and others in surrounding corporate parks. But the days of mine host welcoming visitors to his or her establishment to eat, drink, or be merry have long passed. I want to thank you for your attention. Um, before taking questions, we just like to remind you that all of the History Matters programs are arranged by the Liberal Historical Society, which is an all-volunteer and donation-based organization. If you enjoy these programs, we invite you to support the Society by becoming a member or making a donation. 
You can do both through the Give Join Volunteer page at our website, liberalhistory.org. And with that, we are happy to take questions. I'm going to come back on the screen and see there's a couple of chats. Okay. So we have some, when you have this 1907 map up, I concentrated on the John Bush property in the upper left corner and Bush School was marked. Now I know the school I attended first through third grade was named, grew up on Winchester. Um, yes, we actually have a picture of the old Bush School and then what's called the new Bush School. Um, the new Bush School is actually still standing. Today it is a church. Um, I can't remember the name of it, but it's up on um, the, gathering. the gathering place. Mm -hmm. Okay, so that building still stands with a little um, modification. Okay, um, and then we have uh, Dana on, who is a descendant of the Duddles, and um, he's giving a little more information, which we appreciate. My mother was born in the Newcastle Hotel. Her parents were Richard Duddles and the Lulu Duddles mention. And uh, Richard was the half brother to uh, Alicia Proctor. Let's see, um, after Richard's death in 1925, Lulu carried on the hotel until 19, 1949. She definitely was involved in a bunch of different modernizations. Um, and then there's some more information here. <laughs> so if I could read all of it. Um, my parents, Eleanor Duddles and William Ammon, uh, I hope I'm pronouncing that correctly, moved into one of the apartments after their marriage in 1947. Uh, I wonder if we can see them actually on that 1950 uh, census. I wasn't looking for their name. My grandmother Lulu lived in a large apartment at the north end of the rear addition. They originally lived in the front north apartment before the rear addition was built. Thank you very much for the additional information. All right. Are there other questions? Trying to get to the, there we go. I don't see anything in the Q&A. Um, there's not currently anything else in the chat. We'll give it a couple of minutes to see if something occurs to you. Well, while we're revamping to fill time, if anyone's still thinking of a question, um, this was recorded. Uh, everyone who registered and attended this evening will uh, get a link to the video uh, when it's been posted, probably in the next couple of days. Uh, thank you, Dana, for the presentation. Um, thank everyone else who's thanking us. We appreciate it. Um, again, we'll stay here for a couple of more minutes. Um, we do invite you to attend our March and April History Matters programs. Again, March is on Title IX and Liberal High School Athletics. And uh, then April is on the North Shore Line. Uh, we can take up to about 50 people in person if you'd like to come in person. Uh, there will be books, uh, copies of the books for sale in person. Uh, otherwise, if you're joining us from afar, um, we would welcome you to attend via Zoom. All right, well, it doesn't look like there are other questions and I'm seeing people start to drop off of the call. So if there's nothing else for this evening, again, thank you for attending. Please consider becoming a member or donating to the Historical Society. And we hope to see you at our March and April programs. Thank you very much and have a good evening, everybody.